Well, hey everyone, uh, thanks for thanks for coming. Uh, I'm hoping to spend the next 20 minutes or so sharing what I've learned um, in the last year of working as a developer relations uh, person and also helping to manage a a thriving kind of open source community. So uh, to start things off, you know, I wanted to provide a little bit of context and background uh, into myself, uh, what I've done in the past. Uh, why I'm here, um, then talk a little bit about uh, the jobs to be done around the community. So to, to borrow a word from product management, uh, I used to be a product manager, so I bring a lot of those uh, mental models uh, into de developer relations as well. Uh, then can I talk a little bit about dashboard design? When is, when is you know, how do you actually design a useful dashboard uh, to help help you with, you know, kind of managing and scaling your your community, helping with the gardening efforts there? Uh, then kind of talk really quickly about the kind of technical architecture uh, for the work that we've done. Uh, it's, it's I'm not going to spend too much time on it because there's many different ways you could you could build this, uh, but it's just kind of one reference point for people. And then hopefully at the time we'll have we'll have some time to to answer some questions. So um, yeah, so a little bit about me. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a senior developer advocate at Preset. Uh, before Preset, I spent six years as a data scientist. Um, and uh, five of those years in data science education. So if you've ever used DataQuest, I helped kind of build that online learning platform. Uh, and that was kind of a fun, fun ride. And so I kind of come, uh, I approach developer relations with kind of a, a very strong focus on spreading data literacy. Uh, so maybe I, I think I'm a little bit unorthodox in that way. Um, I am a programmer, but I, I kind of identify as a data scientist first. And I'm really excited about helping um, the whole world learn the skills that I've been able to, that I've been fortunate to pick up over the years, actually working with data to make sense of the world. So you, you can kind of think of it as I spent a, f a bunch of time trying to help people learn the existing data tools out there uh, by working on an online learning platform. And now I'm actually hoping to build better data tools uh, as kind of the other side of, of spreading uh, data literacy and just helping more people work with data. And so, uh, you know, at preset um, as kind of just to provide context into into the community uh, is an open source BI platform um, that was started originally by Max at Airbnb, who also open sourced Airflow. So as a company and a community, we have a strong open source focus. And um, it's especially interesting because we have uh, many different communities, personas, I would say. So we have people that are close to myself who like working with data, who like using it to get things done, uh, analyzing data, visualizing it. Um, that's kind of the persona I identify with the most. But then you also have people who work uh, on databases. So engineers that are kind of working on the next generation of data warehouses and databases. And they're excited about making uh, their data engine work with all of the visualization tools out there. So that's kind of one, one type of persona that we have in our community. And then you also have uh, data engineers, so not kind of people on the database side, but people who are, um, you know, maybe they've used Airflow, they're interested in building large data pipelines, and so they're excited about having a open source BI tool as well. You know, the rest of the data stack has has gone open, um, and so they're excited that there's an open source uh, BI platform. So that's kind of some context into the community that I help kind of manage, and and as a company, we help steward. And so one of the interesting challenges right when I joined, which is about a year ago, is our channel lives in a bunch of different places. So we have a huge Slack community with over 3,000 people, and that's really just a small slice of the total number of people using, using Superset. Uh, but many of them do join our kind of open Slack community. Uh, however, it is not technically our community. So this is kind of an interesting, unique challenge that we have is being an Apache project you know, we it, it, the the IP, so to speak, of the code base is actually technically owned uh, by the Apache Foundation. So their kind of whole goal is to provide a vendor neutral uh, approach to building open source. So it's not just one company that's responsible for driving development and no one can say that they own the project. And so that's kind of interesting that I kind of came into a community that was already existed. It was kind of grassroots to some degree. Uh, and so there's kind of some interesting uh, pros and cons there, but some interesting challenges to kind of manage a community that 
uh, you don't technically own uh, per se and, and drive entirely yourself. Uh, we have GitHub, of course, uh, which maybe feels weird as a community channel, but you know, for open source projects, especially Apache projects, a lot of discussion happens on GitHub, uh, and the, whether it's PRs, issues, you know, GitHub also keeps adding new features like discussions as kind of ways to get people to be more social and collaborative on GitHub. And so because of that, it's a super important channel for us. And uh, we actually have a lot more people that are that have left a comment on GitHub or contributed code on GitHub that, you know, than those that are even active on Slack. So uh, GitHub is huge for us. Uh, and we also have Stack Overflow, of course. Every day someone's asking questions about Superset uh, or related tools or you know, how you know, tool A should work with Superset. And so these, these top three are, are kind of top of mind for us always. On the second tier, we have Meetup, HubSpot, and Zoom. So as a developer advocate, uh, as I'm sure uh, others out here are also doing, you know, you're, you're hosting events, you're hosting community events, uh, you're using HubSpot to maybe send out emails. And when an, when an event has finished, you want to send out a recording to people who couldn't make it uh, for a variety of reasons. And we also use Zoom. Uh, which I have kind of a, a little bit of a love-hate relationship with, uh, as I'm sure many people do here as well. Uh, but it is kind of pretty good for for webinars and uh, has a good integration with with kind of HubSpot and, and Meetup. So uh, we use it for events, and uh, we're less interested in mining data here to like understand like, oh, here are all the people that joined, and here's their emails, and here's where they worked. We're less interested in that. We're more interested in just kind of like, Okay, we've done a different. We've we've tried a different type of community event, uh, focused on databases or focused on uh, you know best practices around dashboard design. Do we have the same people coming to the events or different people? Are we able to kind of get more people in a different persona? Are we able to reach them? And I think that's kind of an interesting thing we can do as well as just understanding generally how many people are coming. Right. So if you if we do an event and only five people show up, uh, should we really do that event? Again, um, you know, it's a question mark. So I think having some basic data here helps. And lastly, in this bottom tier, we have uh, places that we don't control at all and um, are completely kind of, you can say, public. So Reddit, Twitter, and LinkedIn, uh, you know, there's people in your community that likely live in these places that are having conversations about your product or open source project um, or open source movement or whatever it is that you kind of help manage the community around. Uh, and they're, they're in all these places. And it's it's nice to know when a discussion is happening. Um, so you can kind of be there to to help out and offer offer your help. And also just let people know that, um, you know, that you are working on that project. And if they have questions, you know, or even use it as an idea to uh, use it as kind of a jumping off point to understand other types of content uh, that you may create or other types of events. So it's kind of, these are all different kind of just data sources to think about. How do you continue to serve and help the community, even if they're not living in your you know community channels? You still want to know uh, what people are up to and the, the challenges that they're facing. And in many ways, um, even even if you do own the the product and the IP, uh, you know, the community lives where it wants to live. And there's kind of, it kind of grows across many platforms. So you can't always dictate that. Um, and so it's better to embrace it. And I think that is kind of a good, lays the foundation here because that identifies uh, many challenges here. So there's many different jobs to be done. Uh, in fact, the, the list is much longer, I would say, than even this. But these are some of the key ones that we use community dashboards for. So first, just better understand the needs of the community, right? If people are uh, in one channel spending a lot of time trying to deploy the open source project or deal with you know security and cloud uh, cloud vendors and stuff like that uh, and then we have to ask ourselves like are we in a position to support that or is there someone else in the community that's better positioned to support um, those type of long tail of deployment and configuration issues because uh, that's kind of more uh, a traditional support and services uh, company that 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 tries to do that type of thing. If that's something we want to do. Uh, is kind of always something we think about versus people who want to improve the experience between database A and Superset, right? So, and again, one thing that's interesting is Superset works with literally hundreds of databases, and we're not. You know, it's it's almost impossible for us to understand 
all the different databases and every quirk that's that's out there. And uh, yeah, and it's interesting because our community also is living in other database communities, right? There's people who are going who are in the MySQL community or Firebolt or Apache Pino, and they are having issues, uh, and they're they're kind of asking for help in that community, even though uh, the problem maybe lives with our project. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting kind of a thing there as well. Identify and recognize champions. So who who are people that are very active, that are making a difference, uh, that are speaking up and helping out with you know, helping other people, whether that's just responding to Slack messages and pointing them in the right direction uh, with regards to documentation or or examples, or if it's people that are contributing to the open source project. So how do we just identify that? Because in kind of these digital platforms, there's there's always so much going on. Uh, and visualization is a powerful way to understand um, outliers and, and compare distributions and, and things like that. So that's super important. Uh, identify preset employees. So people at companies that I work at where, you know, we have a huge software engineering core and, uh, you know, obviously shipping software is an important thing you can do uh, to contribute to an open source project. But there's, there's tons of other things that uh, we can also do. Uh, obviously, DevRel and community team does a lot of it, but I, I'm always pushing engineers to also uh, make a difference here and share their knowledge because uh, it's something that I may not have. So being able to understand um, where that's happening and the things they're interested in doing is always fun. Um, there's a few others. Another one I'll quickly mention is identifying people living in multiple channels, right? So if there's someone who's active in multiple channels um, and you want to start on GitHub and have a conversation with them about some bug or, or something. And then if you can look up if they're in your Slack or not really quickly, then uh, you can just be like, hey, let's move this over to Slack. Right? So that's kind of an interesting thing. When you know, think about dashboards, you think usually of visualization, but this is kind of also providing a little bit of a command center and a, and a search console in many ways. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, and yeah, there's, there's some other ones. Uh, and and I, you know, I'll quickly provide a, a, a 10 second or 20 second overview of dashboard design. There's kind of three different types of dashboards. You have analytical, which is kind of the, what I call focus on understanding the past. So these are, it's focused on understanding stuff that's already happened. Um, and it's, it's usually not live updating. It's very exploratory. So you're, it's kind of the classic dashboard when you think of someone coming in and slicing and dicing data, moving things around and looking at, you know, messages sent on this date range in this channel from this person, kind of this join of four different criteria. That's usually an exploratory dashboard um, uh, or analytical one. And there's also a strategic dashboard. So this is, you know, uh, Claire from DBT had a great blog post where they're focused on OKR development and they're interested in using the metric of channels, non-default channels joined uh, as kind of an interesting metric because the default channels people are joining doesn't really tell you that much because it's there by default when they join a Slack community, for example. But measuring the the non-default channels people join could c tell you a little bit more about uh, their excitement and the value that they've gotten from the community. Uh, and so that's kind of a that that might be a strategic focus dashboard because you're showing a ton of metrics um, and you're you're showing a, a focus set of metrics that you want the the team to kind of focus on and galvanize around. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, operational, this is the least important, I think, in a community. This is showing the now. This is kind of like the live HUD of a you know airplane cockpit or a car. Um, there's very few things in the community that are like insanely real time and need to be live updating. So in my opinion, mostly steer away from these type of dashboards. <clears throat> so we kind of blogged about some of the dashboards that we've created um, to analyze our community. So we have one that we call uh, the GitHub engagement dashboard. Um, and I'll actually kind of uh, show it here. Naturally, uh, we as a data company, as a BI company, we use our own tool to visualize the data. Um, I think that's just kind of a given at this point, right? It's a great way to dock food. I'll just refresh this so it resizes the charts a little bit. Um, and hopefully this doesn't break. We're still in beta, so yeah, things can things can always break, right? Uh, so this is kind of a, 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 a kind of exploratory dashboard where we currently have one repo where you can actually add other open source. So we always like to look, compare ourselves to other open source projects as well. It's kind of just a fun thing to do um, just to see like, oh, how are we growing compared to other open source projects? Uh, and kind of always kind of rallies the team together. 
And so with this, this is just high level metrics around engagement. So the number of stars, a little bit of a vanity metric, pull requests, general interactions, um, et cetera. And we're especially interested in how the large organizations are contributing to the open source project and how that's changing. So you can just see, like this chart tells a great story of Mac starting superset at Airbnb, and then, which is the nice kind of red, reddish pink uh, hue here, uh, which resembles the Airbnb color. And then over time, um, <clears throat> Lyft started adopting it, and then Preset was started in 2018, which is the green kind of slab in the middle. And now we're kind of one of the most dominant uh, contributing groups um, but we're hoping to kind of onboard other teams as well. So this is kind of a, a way to understand uh, the, the organizations and teams that are contributing and how, how that's changing over time. And of course, you have a classic leaderboard. You know, Max, who created the original project, uh, still has still is number one for the most number of PRs. Uh, but, you know, in the last 28 days, um, he doesn't contribute as much as you could imagine. So we have some other engineers that have stepped up as well. Uh, so it's kind of a cool thing, um, and this kind of a, that was a metrics dashboard. So I especially like this Explorer tab that we have here. Uh, this is an interesting way to to dive in even deeper. So you can look at you know comments created by a specific person. Uh, this is this is GitHub. So it's going to be the GitHub handle, uh, and then we also have uh, have a rough kind of categorization of GitHub handles to organization. And so this is, you know, if you were to do this, this is something you would have to add um, is the kind of mapping um, because uh, it, it can be difficult sometimes to build a generic dashboard that can work for any project because uh, that information is, is somewhat context sensitive. Um, and then, you know, GitHub has a lot of bots. Superset project has a lot of bots as well. So um, do we want to filter out the bot events or not? So this is kind of a way to understand just this is kind of an activity stream, right? So what is the last... 10 things that have happened in any way on the superset project. And then you can you can drill in further into the specific uh, actions that you want to look at. So if you want to look at just kind of PRs created uh, recently, then this will update and you can see the organizations creating PRs. Um, so you got other, which is people we haven't grouped into a natural company or organization yet. Um, and this is all time as well. So we can put a time range to just look at the last uh, three days or last nine days. So this is kind of an interesting way. You, you, there's so many things you can do here, right? Like this isn't even showcasing the full potential. Um, you can look at all the issues that have been closed by a specific person. You can look at all the PRs that have been merged and are they more about fixes? Um, are they focused more on refactoring? Um, are they feature PRs? And so this is kind of all, and, and then also who contributed that that code, right? So it's it's kind of a really powerful way to ask questions and and attempt to answer them um, in a more self-serve type of way. <clears throat> and then second, we built the Slack dashboard. It's still a work in progress, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll say, but uh, we found it really fun to play with here. <clears throat> excuse me. So we have the Slack dashboard. Um, and this is our Slack community that I mentioned earlier, has over 3,500 people. Um, and it's kind of, you know, there's an easy way to just, so some of these are just high level metrics. So just the number of messages, um, the time zones that people live in. Uh, but what's really fun is actually being able to filter this down. So I can look at just myself um, and see kind of my own contribution to the community, right? So where am I posting the most? Um, and yeah, this is kind of, this is what's called an area chart. So it'll show each channel and the number of messages in each channel that have been posted, this is just by me. And so these are all the, so I tend to post most in beginner questions, introductions channel as well, where I always, uh, you know, wave and, and introduce people, ask people to introduce themselves when they join the channel. Uh, so that kind of all makes sense. And also how my weekly messages have changed in the last uh, quarter. Um, some weeks where I post a little bit less, but you know, I try to stay in that 50 to 80 messages per, uh, per week which works out to about 10 messages a day. And then the most popular channels visualize another way. So this is removing the time dimension and just looking at where do I post and interact with the most. So I like helping beginners. You know, I have a background in teaching people things. So uh, helping beginners is, is often where I get the most joy. Uh, new people joining the community, excited out about that as well. And then uh, also when we, when we write new content or when people want to write new content, I'm also there 
to help out as well. So we have a content share channel focus on that. So we've used this data to overhaul our Slack, um, overhaul the community Slack rather a few different times. So there used to be more channels. We Anytime uh, a channel kind of dips in message popularity, we try to combine it with another channel. We renamed all the channels, for example. So I'm a big fan of not having a hashtag general channel because I think it's um, it, it ends up becoming this kind of cesspool of random messages. It's truly it's truly general and it's really hard to manage. So we renamed that to community announcements and uh, which is right over here and we locked it so only some people can post announcements there. Um, I'm a big fan of that instead kind of encouraging people to actually uh, post in uh, specific channels. So we had a channel called customizing superset or contributing or improving superset which much clearer labels whereas in the past slack channels were created haphazardly um, and the data has shown that this has been great for generally just getting people to engage more and also answering their own questions um obviously it's always fun to identify who the champions are uh not to toot my own horn but i am very active in our own slack community we also have another engineer ty dupree uh who's also a core contributor to superset he's uh he's also very active at slack so this is number of messages posted just in the last quarter uh just kind of as a fun fun thing uh yeah so looks like i have a few more minutes i quickly wanted to mention uh, two mental models. So I think a lot of people here have heard of the orbit model. I'm generally a fan of it. Uh, and I think really the only way to implement a model like orbit is to analyze uh, and visualize data from multiple channels because your observers could be everyone who ever, you know, liked a tweet about your project, ever visited an anonymous visitor who visited the open source project page. Um, asked a question on Stack Overflow, it can be, it's so large, right? And so it's, it's always good to know uh, just the general reach that you have, that the product is having. Uh, and a lot of that is likely because of um, community and dev efforts. Uh, so observers kind of is the is the, the lowest tier stage in some ways. Uh, maybe you can think of it as a Saturn or Pluto um, in, their, in their kind of analogy here. The hope is that some of those people will become participants, so they'll um, you know, they'll have questions, uh, they, uh, you know, will want to get some help, they'll want to feel like a part of the community, so they'll start to participate. And that's huge, getting people from just stage four to stage three. Uh, I think that's that's really important for DevRel to, to kind of own and make sure people are, are feeling welcome to participate. Um, hopefully some of them will become contributors. And then, you know, the, the happiest day is when they become advocates, when someone is writing blog posts or giving talks about your project and you never ask them to. They're just so excited about the community that they feel like they want to do that. And I think that's that's really powerful. I'll quickly mention the funnel model. I know this is a controversial topic in DevRel, but it's, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's ideal, especially for nascent communities. I will say that I've spoken to many heads of DevRel at much larger companies. And I think there is a lot of pressure to go this route as the organization scales. Uh, but the way I think about it is that I don't think it's such a bad thing for very, very large community organizations as long as it's focused on top of funnel. So just getting people to become observers or even participants, um, but not kind of focused on efficiency, like, oh, how many people visited the landing page and signed up or used the product? I think that's kind of the goal of product marketing and product and engineering, um, not kind of community. And I think of it a lot like, investing in basic science research, the second you turn it into a funnel activity or an ROI activity, um, it starts to lose um, some of the value. Um, I'll quickly mention our technical architecture. We use, we use all open source components. Um, you know, Airbyte is something we like because it's, it's easy to get going and they have lots of connectors uh, and we're friendly with their community. So this has been a cool, our, the tracker in the dashboards I've shown, it's been a cool community building tool as well. Uh, and if you're interested, we're going to talk about the, the technical architecture behind the tracker. So you know, you can check it out at preset.io slash events. Uh, it's June 29th, I believe, where my coworker will be talking about uh, how we build and manage this. Um, so we use an open source data integration tool. Uh, we just use everything in in Postgres. Um, it's not a big, it's not the most scalable thing for just for analytics data, but it works fine for our kind of small use case. And obviously, we're using our own tool for visualizing data. Um, and last thing before Q and A, what's next for the tracker? So 
uh, was basically our word for our collection of dashboards here, uh, more data, right? So Stack Overflow is not something we have yet because there's not an Airbyte connector for it, but we're hoping to develop it. So it's also a way to show some love to that community is to build more data connectors. Um, and then we can start to track questions people are asking and look for themes there as well and our own ability to answer those questions. Reddit, as I mentioned earlier, would be a great one, uh, as well as Medium and YouTube, really understand how many people are becoming advocates and um, and and start to you know show them some love. And lastly, I do want to mention, uh, we'd love to enable, enable this for other communities. So if you're a, uh, a DevRel person or a community manager and you would like a set of dashboards for your community, please get in touch. We're hoping to kind of build relationships with other communities um, by offering this kind of just for free. Just, you know, tell us where your community lives. We'll use public data. If you want us to use, you know, private Slack data, we can do that as well. Uh, but we want to kind of build relationships with other open source communities uh, by kind of uh, offering this for free for anyone who wants to use this. Um, and it's also just good dog fooding and feedback for the tool as well. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what I came here to talk about. Um, hope it was interesting. I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you.